Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Ali. I'm a doctor turned entrepreneur and the author of Feel Good Productivity, which is a book about how to be more productive in a way that feels good. But in this video, I wanna talk about four books other than my own that can genuinely change your life. Now, before we go into that, this idea of books being life-changing or whatever is a bit of a clickbait thing that we often see on YouTube. And I've made videos in the past where I say, this book has changed my life. And there are always people in the comments that are a bit cynical or skeptical about that. Like how could a book possibly change your life? So before we dive into these four books, which I suspect most of these books you've probably not heard of and you've probably not read, I wanna share a little bit of my thoughts and philosophy around what it means for a book to completely change your life. And this video is sponsored by HubSpot, but more on them later. So the way in which a book changes your life is that a book exposes you to a particular idea. Now that idea then leads to a decision and that decision then leads to action. And then that action then leads to result. And that result is the thing that changes your life. So for example, I would say that the book, The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss completely changed my life. Why did it change my life? because it exposed me to the idea that I could make passive income and that I could build a business that generates money while I'm sleeping so that I can then live life on my own terms. Broadly, that was the key idea that the 4-Hour Workweek exposed me to. It's got a couple of hundred pages, it's got a bunch of other ideas, but that was the key thing that I took away from it. Now, it wouldn't have been a life-changing book if I didn't then make a decision based on that idea. And the decision I made after reading that book was, I am therefore going to spend my years in medical school building a business on the side that can generate passive income so that when I work as a doctor, I can do it for fun rather than because I have to. And that decision led to an action. It meant that while I was going through medical school, I was looking for ways that I could possibly make money on the side. I learned how to code. I improved my skills with programming. And I ended up building a business while I was going through medical school that was making me around $40,000, $50,000 a year, which is what I would have been earning had I been working full time as a doctor. So that was pretty sick. And that business then morphed into this YouTube channel, which has completely changed my life. And so when I say that the book, The 4-Hour Workweek changed my life, it's because it gave me that particular idea. And so if you watch these sorts of videos about, you know, this book changed my life, please don't think that I'm just trying to clickbait you here with this freaking title is like, oh, every other day, Ali's life is changed by a goddamn book. It kind of is, it's probably not every other day, but anytime I read a book, what I'm on the lookout for is an idea that could potentially change the course of my life. And so the four books that I wanna talk about in this video are books that I think if you were to read them and genuinely apply them and they hit you at the right time, these books can give you an idea that causes you to make a decision, which causes you to take action, that leads to results. And then you will look back on this video and say, wow, this video changed my life because it gave me the idea to read these books that I might not have read otherwise. Now this is quite a wide assortment of books. And so I'd recommend you skip around in the timestamps because realistically, you probably don't wanna read all four of these right now because like chances are one of these will resonate more with you than the other three. And that's totally okay. I would recommend reading that one and applying the insights from it and seeing if you can potentially make a decision, which leads to action, which leads to results based on just that one recommendation. But because lots of people follow this channel, thankfully, thank you for that. Um, I wanna kind of share a bit of a variety. And these are all books that I discovered this year. Book number one is a book called The Practice by Seth Godin. And this book is aimed at anyone who does creative work. Basically, if the thing that you do or the thing that you'd like to do involves shipping creative work, then this book is for you. So what does shipping creative work mean? And here's a quote from the book that explains it. Shipping, because it doesn't count if you don't share it. Creative, because you're not a cog in the system. You're a creator, a problem solver, a generous leader who's making things better by producing a new way forward. And work, because it's not a hobby. You might not get paid for it, not today, but you approach it as a professional. The muse is not the point, excuses are avoided, and the work is why you are here. And the core idea that I've taken away from this book that I think can change your life if you take this idea and really apply it on board is the idea that, it's gonna sound cliche, but the process and the practice is what counts not the output. Seth Godin writes, the practice is not the means to the output, the practice is the output, because the practice is all we can control. The practice demands that we approach our process with commitment. It acknowledges that creativity is not an event, it's simply what we do, whether or not we're in the mood. Sculptor Elizabeth King said it beautifully, process saves us from the poverty of our intentions. And basically this whole book is just Seth Godin saying again and again and again in a bunch of different ways that when you are in the business of shipping creative work, you've got to focus on the process, you've got to not be attached to the outcome, and you've got to focus on just showing up for the process, showing up like a professional and getting better at that thing over time. And that itself is the reward. The reward for doing good work is the ability to do more good work. This morning, I was going through my highlights of this book. I've made about 70 different highlights from this book. I'll put a link down below if you wanna see them to my Notion page for the highlight. But this book resonated with me so much because as a creator, sometimes I struggle with the process. I know that, you know, when I was writing my book, that the creative work was in showing up and doing the writing every day. I know that for making YouTube videos, the creative work is in showing up and filming the videos and preparing the videos. But I often let emotions and feelings and like, oh, I don't feel like doing this, therefore I don't wanna do it. Like there are a lot of times where I don't treat it like a professional. 
But weirdly, on the times where I do treat it like a professional, where the reason I'm making the video is not for the sake of a sponsor deadline or for the sake of like some sort of external metric, but the reason I'm making the video is so that I can genuinely share from the heart, share with the, with the intention of love and contribution and service, and then show up and make the video. It just feels freaking amazing. It's sort of like, kind of like going to the gym. Sometimes you don't feel like going, but if you actually just push yourself and make yourself do the thing and just focus on the process and focus on showing up as your best self, at the end of it, there's no world in which you don't feel good having been to the gym. And it's the same with this sort of creative work. And the reason that I think this book is life-changing is because I know so many creators who struggle with having their self-worth too attached to the outcome of the process. They're not focused on the process, they're focused on the outcome. They feel bad if a video doesn't get that many views. I've been through this myself. They feel bad if the video gets negative comments. They feel bad if, for example, someone someone replies being like, oh, this wasn't that helpful. Whereas the creators who I know who are the happiest are almost the ones who detach themselves from the outcome. They're just showing up, they're focused on the process, and for them, it's a win if they get the video out, if they've spent the time filming the video, if they spent the time writing the thing. Even if they've written a thousand words and the next day they delete all thousand words, the fact is they are still proud of themselves because they showed up and they did the work. And you know, when it comes to these sorts of nonfiction books, I would know having, having written one myself, often there are just like one to three key ideas in the book. And the rest of the book, some people would say very cynically is just fluff. But actually, I could tell you right now through this video, yeah, just focus on enjoying the process. But like, you know that intellectually, but through experiencing it and through reading a book about it that tells you the same thing again and again and again in loads of different ways with loads of different examples, that is when it becomes more than just intellectual knowledge. That's when it starts to seep into your soul, into your body, into your heart, whatever terminology you wanna use. And this is why reminders are super helpful. This is why, you know, Atomic Habits is an amazing book. Fundamentally, the one thing he says is small habits lead to great results. But if you read the book, you know, it's freaking amazing. It's really, really, really helpful, even though he's just saying that one thing. So it's not filled with fluff, as cynics kind of sometimes say. It's almost like, for example, if you're watching a comedy show and they just gave you the punchline, that's not a very fun comedy show to watch. You kind of need the build up to benefit from the punchline. Similarly, if you're listening to a musical performance and all you had was climaxes and the crescendos, that's not particularly fun because the build up is what makes the crescendo and the climax worth it, in the words of Alan Watts. So I'd encourage you, if you take even one thing away from this video, please do not dismiss the value of nonfiction books like this. If the right book hits you at the right time and gives you the right idea, Oh man, that can completely change your life. And the practice by Seth Godin is one that's completely changed my own creative process because now I'm less focused on myself, more focused on service and more, more focused on showing up. Even if I don't feel like it, I will still show up. And maybe I won't film a video directly because I kind of feel like I wanna film videos when I feel like it, but I'll at least show up, get myself to a coffee shop, drink a cup of coffee and at least do some creative work, do some writing, get some highlights from a book, summarize what I think about it, write it for my weekly email newsletter. And the more I stick to this process and focus on the process, the better everything in my life becomes. So that is the first book, The Practice by Seth Godin. And if you are a creator in any form, I think you will get enormous value. And I think that book might just change your life. Now, this book is all about shipping creative work. But if you are like me and you ship creative work, and then you also want to create a business out of it, then you might like to check out HubSpot, who are very kindly sponsoring this video. HubSpot is powerful, flexible, and easy to use software that's built for growing your business. And we are actively using it in our business as well. We've been dreaming about having the perfect CRM for our part-time YouTube accelerator for years. And we finally switched to HubSpot and it is such a breath of fresh air. And it's so magical to be able to connect all of our data all in one place. Through the platform, you get a ton of insight into your entire sales process by being able to track all of your leads all of the way from when they first sign up to something to when they're a loyal customer. And that is insanely helpful. And whether or not you're at the stage yet where you want to build a whole sales and marketing and customer success CRM, HubSpot actually has a bunch of quick, practical online courses that you can take as well, along with comprehensive certifications so that you can learn everything you need to know about the most sought after business skills. They also have a great free template for being more productive at work, which has loads of information and tips about how to manage your day and your energy, which is the sort of stuff that I talk about in my book as well, as well as stuff about remote working and actually the HubSpot resources on remote working have been super helpful for me and my team over the last few months as I've been traveling the world and switching to a remote lifestyle. You can check out HubSpot and get all of these resources completely for free by hitting the link in the video description. So thank you so much HubSpot for sponsoring this video and let's move on to book number two. Okay, the next book that we're gonna talk about that is a book that you've almost certainly not heard of and it's called The Strangest Secret by Earl Nightingale. Now Earl Nightingale is this American motivational speaker, author, coach kind of guy who was around in like the 1950s in the US on radio and on TV. Earl had this classic kind of rags to riches story. He was born during the time of the Great Depression and he grew up in poverty. And The Strangest Secret is actually a record that he recorded in 1956. It's like an audio program which has been converted into a book. And his whole thing apparently was that he was trying to figure out why is it that some people grow rich and prosperous and why does do people like his family end up growing up in poverty? And so he did a bunch of reading and ended up becoming like this motivational speaker and stuff. And so this book, The Strangest Secret, is like one of these OG from like the 1950s self-help books that has a core message. <laughs> and the core 
message is going to sound weird. It's going to sound cliche, but I think if you take the idea on board, it can completely change your life. And that idea is the power of knowing what you want and writing it down. That's basically it. His, the whole, I'm not a huge fan of the second half of the book, but the first half of the book, I highlighted the absolute living daylights out of. And there's a quote here about the secret to success. He says, I'll tell you who the successful people are. A success is the school teacher who is teaching school because that's what she wanted to do. The success is the woman who is a wife and mother because she wanted to become a wife and mother and is doing a good job of it. The success is the man who runs the corner gas station because that's what he wanted to do. The success is the successful salesman who wants to become a top-notch salesman and grow and build with his organization. A success is anyone who is doing deliberately a predetermined job because that's what he decided to do deliberately but only one in 20 people actually does that. And I actually really like this definition of success. He's not saying that success is trying to be rich. He's not saying success is trying to become famous or popular or whatever the thing is. He's saying you are successful when you are working towards doing the thing that you actually want to do. That's it. Whether it's being a mom or a housewife or a teacher or a businessman or entrepreneur or YouTuber or author, you are successful if you are actively taking steps to work towards the thing that you actually want. And the problem is, very few people actually know what they want. For example, if I were to meet you in a coffee shop right now and we were having a conversation for whatever reason, and I were to say, hey, can you show me where you've written down your goals for the next year? You'd probably say, what goals for the next year? If you've thought about your goals, then you probably haven't written them down. There are, there are very few people who A, know what they actually want to do and B, write it down somewhere. And Earl Nightingale and a lot of these books like Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, Anything by Jim Rohn, Anything by Tony Robbins, like all of these, self-helpy type people, including me, ultimately land on the conclusion that if you know where you are trying to go, then you'll figure out the how of how you're gonna get there. But so few people actually know where they're trying to go that like they end up meandering around all over, all over the place. And Earl's definition of success is you're working towards the thing that you actually wanna do. So this is not actually that hard. The whole thing is just figure out what you actually wanna do and turn it into a goal and just write it down. Doesn't need to be a smart goal, doesn't need to be that specific or measurable or achievable. Or achievable. You just need to have some idea of where you're actually trying to go. And the way I think of goals is that setting a goal is like understanding where is the destination. And that's not to say that you are then fixated on the destination, but it is to say that you are then taking steps or moving in the direction of that destination. And given that you know roughly what the destination is, you can also then assess, am I on the right path to go towards that particular destination? If you know, for example, that you wanna write three books in the next 10 years, cool, that's really useful to know. That means on average, one book every three and a half years. And so you can then assess, am I actually taking the steps to get there? This is not to say you're fixated on it. It's not to say that, you know, that you're wedded to that particular timeline. Maybe it'll be 12 years, maybe it'll be eight years, but you're way more likely to write three books if you have set the intention of, I wanna write three books in the next 10 years. Here's another great quote from the book. People with goals succeed because they know where they're going. Think of a ship leaving a harbor and think of it with a complete voyage mapped out and planned. The captain and crew know exactly where it's going and how long it will take. It has a definite goal. 9,999 times out of 10,000, it will get to where it started out to get. Now let's take another ship, just like the first. Only let's not put a crew on it or a captain of the helm. Let's give it no aiming point, no goal, no destiny. We just start the engine and let it go. I think you'll agree with me that if it gets out of the harbor at all, it will either sink or wind up on some deserted beach, a derelict. It can't go any place because it has no destination, no guidance. And this book has had a major impact on me because it literally in like the half an hour it took me to read the first half of this book completely sold me on the idea of setting goals. In the past, if you've been following the channel for a while, you know I've, I've had a bit of like, oh, I'm not really sure whether setting goals is worthwhile or not. And now I'm like, of course it is. It's useful to have a destination in mind because there is no journey without a destination in mind. Again, not to say you're gonna be fixated on the destination, but if you know where you're going, then you are far more likely to marshal resources and to find a way to get there and to enjoy the process of getting there, which is the whole thesis of my book, Feel Good Productivity. Like how do you find a way to make the journey itself feel good? Because sure, maybe you'll get to the destination, but you'll realize when you get there that the journey is what mattered in the first place. But crucially, even though the journey is what matters, you cannot have a journey without a destination, without feeling meandering and without feeling like you don't know where your life is going and all this kind of stuff. And the more clarity you can have on where you're actually trying to go, the more likely you are to actually get there and to enjoy the process along the way. So if you currently do not have goals, do not have them written down somewhere. Perhaps you might enjoy reading The Stranger Secret by Earl Nightingale. It will take you like half an hour to read. You can skip the second half. I don't really like the second half. Or, you know, I'm sure it's good, but it didn't vibe with me at this stage of my life right now. But the first half completely vibed with me. And I was like, oh my freaking God, this is bloody incredible stuff. And again, I'll put my highlights in the link down below if you're interested in just reading the highlights and then you can decide if the book is for you or not. All right, book number three that I think might have the potential to change your life is a book called No More Mr. Nice Guy by Robert Glover. Now, I agree, the title of this book is a little bit clickbaity and you might think, oh, No More Mr. Nice Guy, is this some book that's gonna teach men to become even more assholeish or like all that kind of stuff? It is not that at all. I've highlighted the absolute shit out of this. I actually read this like 10 years ago and I've been 
every few years I find myself rereading it and taking new things away from it because it's basically a book, if I were to sum it up in one sentence, it's a book that encourages men to be mindful of and express their own feelings. It's basically a book that says, as a dude, it's okay to have feelings, it's okay to have needs, and it's okay to express those feelings and needs and to love yourself for who you are rather than trying to perform and gain the approval of other people. Now, if you are a guy like me and you struggle like me to understand and express your own emotions and feelings and needs, then I think you will get enormous value from this book. Here's a fun quote. Consider this. If you did not care what people thought of you, how would you live your life differently? If you were not concerned with getting the approval of women, how would your relationships with the opposite sex be different? Nice guys seek external validation in just about every social situation, but their quest for approval is the most pronounced in their relationships with women. Nice guys interpret a woman's approval as the ultimate validation of their worth. Signs of a woman's approval can take the form of her desire to have sex, flirtatious behavior, a smile, a touch, or attentiveness. At the other end of the spectrum, if a woman is depressed, in a bad mood, or angry, nice guys interpret these things to mean that she is not accepting or approving of them. Nice guys have a difficult time comprehending that in general, people are not drawn to perfection in others. People are drawn to shared interests, shared problems, and an individual's life energy. Humans connect with humans. Hiding one's humanity and trying to project an image of perfection makes a person vague, slippery, lifeless, and uninteresting. I often refer to nice guys as Teflon men. They work so hard to be smooth, nothing can stick to them. Unfortunately, this Teflon coating also makes it difficult for people to get close. It is actually a person's rough edges and human imperfections that give others something to connect with. I've got so many highlights from this book. It's really, really good. Again, I'll share a link to my highlights down below if you want to check them out. But basically, the whole book is about teaching guys that it's okay to have feelings, and it's okay to have needs, and it's okay to express them, and you don't need to have shame around the fact that you have feelings and needs and your own preferences. And actually, you know, this narrative that we're taught as men that like your job on this earth is to sacrifice yourself for the sake of the other people in your life. You know, maybe there's some truth to that. We're going to talk about, we're going to talk more about that in the fourth book. But it's like that thing with the in the airplanes, like you put your own oxygen mask on first before helping other people with it. And I think this applies to me this applies to basically most of my male friends. We really struggle to express our emotions and feelings and needs. And the exercises and journaling prompts and everything in this book, No More Mr. Nice Guy, are super, super helpful and could potentially change the course of your life if any of this sort of stuff has resonated with you so far. And now we're on to book number four, which is an amazing book called The Second Mountain by David Brooks. Now, the whole thesis of this book is that there are two mountains that we climb in life. The first mountain is the mountain of the self. It's the mountain of achievement. It's the mountain of freedom. It's the mountain of, I want to make money. I want to be successful. I want to make something of myself. And then one of three things happen. Either we get to the top of the first mountain, scenario number one, or we get knocked off that first mountain and into the valley through someone close to us having a health problem or dying or ourselves having a health problem or dying or some kind of major life event that takes us off of the first mountain. And then we end up in this valley. And in the valley is when we realize that, oh, there is actually a second mountain. And the second mountain is the mountain of commitment. It's the mountain of service. It's the mountain of where your life is not just about you. It's about serving other people. It's about committing to something. It's about building a family. It's about contributing to something greater than yourself. It's about getting involved in your local community, getting involved in your local church or mosque or whatever the thing might be, like really going for your business because of the service that it provides. David Brooks argues that while the first mountain might make you happy and give you freedom, the second mountain gives you joy. And lasting joy is actually way better than momentary happiness. Now, if any of that resonates with you, if you're at a stage of your life where maybe you've been on the first mountain for a long time, as I have, <laughs> and you might find, you know, I've, in fairness, I've, I've gotten to the top of the first mountain. Uh, I've got freedom, I've got success, I'm famous. People come to me on the streets and they say how much they love me, how much my work's changed their life, all this kind of crap. I've got loads of money, all this kind of stuff. This is all like first mountain crap. This is all like, I'm optimizing for freedom. I'm focusing on myself. I want to be famous. I want to be rich. I want to be successful. But you get there and you realize that it's not all it's cracked up to be. And when you're at the top of the first mountain, it sort of feels a bit hollow. It sort of feels like, uh, do I really want to continue working for more fame and more achievements and more accolades and more freedom and more like optionality and more like lack of attachment? Is, is really, is, is that really what I want? And when I read this book, I read it, I've, I've been slowly reading it on and off over the last year. And again, so much stuff in this has resonated with me. I'm just gonna read out some highlights because I like reading highlights. There's a crucial way to tell whether you are on your first or second mountain. Where is your ultimate appeal to self or to something outside the self. If the first mountain is about building up the ego and defining the self, the second mountain is about shedding the ego and losing the self. If the first mountain is about acquisition, the second mountain is about contribution. If the first mountain is elitist moving up, the second mountain is egalitarian, planting yourself amid those who need and walking arm in arm with them. Ah, oh, beautiful. Here's another one. People on the first mountain have lives that are mobile and lightly attached. People on the second mountain are deeply rooted and deeply committed. The second mountain life is a committed life. When I'm describing how second mountain people live, what I'm really describing is how these people made maximal commitments to others and how they live them out in fervent, 
all in ways. These people are not keeping their options open. They are planted. People on the second mountain have made strong commitments to one or all of these four things, a vocation, a spouse and family, a philosophy or faith, and a community. <sighs> stuff i'm at the moment like i'm currently in la filming this um because i'm in the middle of a digital nomad traveling around the world and i know a lot of people who have done this sort of thing and they usually say somewhere between 6 12 18 24 months into the journey you realize that actually all of this travel and all this freedom is no longer that fulfilling i haven't done it before so i'm doing it but i kind of know full well based on people i've been speaking to and based on reading this book that the thing that's going to bring me lasting joy is not the ability to just travel the world and do whatever i want the thing that's going to bring me lasting joy is getting married, having a family, committing myself to like a thing, <laughs> really taking my job seriously and like sharing ideas and showing up in full service mode and full contribution with love and contribution and stuff, even and, and not worrying about the money. And I just know that if I just do that, it'll bring me lasting joy and it'll probably make loads of money as well. Here's another highlight. My first mountain was an insanely lucky one. I achieved far more professional success than I ever expected to, but that climb turned me into a certain sort of person. Aloof, invulnerable, and uncommunicative, at least when it came to my private life. But when I look back generally on the errors and failures and sins of my life, they tend to be failures of omission, failures to truly show up for the people I should have been close to. They tend to be the sins of withdrawal, evasion, workaholism, conflict and avoidance, failure to empathize, and a failure to express myself openly. I have two old and dear friends who live 250 miles from me, for example, and their side of the friendship has required immense forbearance and forgiveness for all the times I've been too busy, too disorganized, too distant when they were in need or just available. I look at those dear friendships with a gratitude mixed with shame. And this pattern, not being present to what I love because I prioritize time over people, productivity over relationship, is a recurring motif in my life. Oh, mate, there's another really good one. I, I felt really called out by this. He describes the sort of person who's in on the first mountain. <laughs> in centuries past, emerging adults took their parents, jobs, faiths, towns, and identities. But in the age of I'm free to be myself, you're expected to find your own career path, your own social tribe, your own beliefs, values, life partners, gender roles, political viewpoints, and social identities. As a student, your focus was primarily on the short term, but now you need a different set of navigational skills to the far horizon goals you'll begin to orient your life towards. And then he goes on to kind of describe this person who lives on the first mountain. This is an excellent way to begin your 20s. But the problem with this kind of life only becomes evident a few years down the road if you haven't settled down into one thing. If you say yes to everything year after year, you end up leading what Kierkegaard lamented as an aesthetic style of life. The person leading the aesthetic life is leading his life as if it were a piece of art, judging it by aesthetic criteria. Is it interesting or dull? Pretty or ugly? Pleasurable or painful? And here is where I felt really called out. Such a person schedules a meditation retreat here, a burning man visit there, one fellowship one year and another one the next. There's swing dancing one day, soul cycle twice a week, Krav Maga for a few months, Bikram Yoga for a few months more, and occasionally a cool art gallery on a Sunday afternoon. Your Instagram feed will be amazing and everybody will think you're the coolest person ever. You tell yourself that relationships really matter to you, scheduling drinks, having lunch, but after you've had 20 social encounters in a week, you forget what all those encounters are supposed to build to. You have thousands of conversations and remember none. The problem is that the person in the aesthetic phase sees life as possibilities to be experienced and not projects to be fulfilled or ideals to be lived out. He will hover above everything, but never land. In the aesthetic way of life, each individual day is fun, but it doesn't add up to anything. In the aesthetic way of life, each individual day is fun, but it doesn't seem to add up to anything. And if you feel like this concept, this metaphor, first mountain, second mountain resonates, if you feel like maybe you're like me and that you've been chasing your own selfish needs for success and freedom and fame and money and all that shit for way too long, and now you feel like actually there's something more to life, there's something, there's more joy to be found in commitment, in attachment, in settling down, as it were, and you settling down is not a bad thing. If you're at that stage of life, I think you're going to love this book. It's really, really good. Mate, David Brooks, what a fucking legend. What a fantastic book. Now, if you go to the end of this video and you've been vibing with the way my philosophy on this sort of stuff, you might like to check out this video over here, which is a life update video that I did recently that's very long that shares some of these sentiments around this sort of second mountain stuff and some of the realizations I've had around kind of serving the self, serving other people, doing what I want, like chasing money, fulfillment, all happiness, all that kind of stuff. That's in a video right over there. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.